Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it. And thank you for the revelation of the truth that comes forth this night. And we praise you for all that you bring forth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. We began talking about the plan of redemption from the very beginning with the creation. And we looked at many things. And the last time we saw how God works through covenant relationship and the different covenants in the Old Testament that were brought forth that were fulfilled by Jesus Christ in the New Testament to accomplish His work. Tonight we're going to talk about the chronology of the last week of Jesus. This is important to understand because of the false teaching that has come forth in the body of Christ regarding this and also for your understanding of many scriptures that appear to be contradiction, but they're not a contradiction when we understand what's being said. First of all, we see what Jesus came to do in John 1, 29. Here's the next day when John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He is the, was the Lamb of God, sinless, who went to the cross to become sin in order to bear away the sin, in order to accomplish the redemption. We see what happened to him on the cross in John chapter 3, in verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Remember, he was a lamb as he went to the cross, but what happened? He was made sin, and you will see that, which means that's him becoming a serpent. The sin was laid upon him in order to bear it away. We see in verse 15 that whosoever believeth on him should not or may, might not perish, but be ha may be having eternal life. These are subjunctive mood verbs here. It's conditional. You have to meet the conditions here. When he talks about that if he believes on him, he might not perish as long as he follows the way of the Lord continually. The subjunctive mood is a conditional statement in the Greek. And whenever it's, you see it, it means there's conditions that have to be met. And then when he says that they may have eternal life, again, that depends on us continually following the way of the Lord. Again, a conditional statement. And this is to be an ongoing work in your life, present tense, meaning continu continuous, ongoing action. Well, Jesus, of course, was then going to accomplish this work. And when he did go to the cross, we must understand what happened. First of all, we need to look at a couple scriptures before we get into the day-by-day -day chronology. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, Important scripture regarding what happened. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart, which would be the center of the earth, which is in hell where he was. Three days and three nights is 72 hours. It's not partial days. It's a whole day of 24 hours. There are three days and three nights. So that'll be important to realize later. When we also come to Mark chapter 8, we see in verse 31, a statement was made, began to teach them, and the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, he would rise. Not rise again. It's not there in really the Greek word understanding. This simply means it's the word anastemi. Estemi means to stand, and the prefix would mean to stand up. He's going to stand up from what, what state he was in, which is what? In spiritual death, having taken all the sins upon mankind, he was going to rise up out of it. And he was going to come to the place of being the firstborn from the dead. In fact, Jesus even declared in Matthew chapter 27, in verse 63, here we see, they, they, this is what they spoke about him, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. Again, this referring to one who is going to rise, 
not again, but to rise. And this really means that he is going to be being raised because it's a passive voice, meaning God's going to do it. And it would have an ongoing effect in his life, present tense, because he was in a spiritual dead state, having been made sin in hell. You'll see all that in a little bit. This is important to understand when we begin to see what happened day by day. First of all, the prevailing teaching in many Christian circles today is that Jesus died on Friday, and they call it Good Friday, and that he was raised at sunrise, which would be at beginning of Sunday morning. Well, if you look at the top point from Good Friday, if that was the case, and it was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, in order to come to, let's say, sunrise or somewhere around there on Sunday morning, is that 72 hours? No. It is not 72 hours. You cannot fit 72 hours into that period whatsoever. In fact, from Friday at 3 p.m. to Sunday at 6 a.m. is only 39 hours. And yet it was three days and three nights. So there's something wrong. The teaching is false. Jesus did not die on Good Friday. And it wasn't happening there, as you'll see, the sunrise service is all false. It all has come from sun worship, false doctrine that has come from false religion. One of the things we need to also realize, in Matthew chapter 2, the time when Jesus was born, because many people, the reason why they say that Jesus died on Friday and was raised on Sunday is because they understand that it was Passover and Passover is the 14th day of Nisan, the first day, month of the year. And in, 20, or in uh, 33 AD, on the Friday, was Nisan 14. That's why they can fit in Friday. But it doesn't work because Jesus was not crucified at the time when they think that he was, that which would be 33 A.D. No, it couldn't have been 33 A.D. Because first of all, again, Friday couldn't have been it because you can't have three days and three nights. It doesn't fit. Furthermore, if 33 A.D. was the time when he was crucified, well, if we go back and we look, he was three and a half years of ministry. That means that would be in 29 A.D. when he started his ministry. If you go back 30 years from that, that's going to take you back to like 2 B.C. There's no zero year. Could Jesus have been born in 2 B.C.? No, it's impossible. Because in Matthew 2, 1 here, it speaks about in, uh, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod. Herod was the king. Herod died in 4 B.C. So it's impossible for Jesus to have been born in 2 B.C. because he's the one, remember, that had all the children being killed from two years and under. So it had to be prior to 4 B.C. In fact, Josephus relates Herod's death at the time of the lunar eclipse in 4 B.C. and that this was shortly before a Passover, so this was in the spring of the year. So that's impossible that it could have been in 2 B.C., it had to be before that. And, in fact, it was in 5 B.C. when Jesus was born. When you take 5 B.C. and you go forward from the 30, 30, about the 30 years, you come to the time when Jesus began his ministry, which was 26 A.D., and then you go three and a half years of that, brings you up to 30 A.D., and that was the time when Jesus went to the cross, because in 30 A.D., Nisan day 14, went on a Friday, it was on a Wednesday. And a Wednesday, then 72 hours from Wednesday at 3 o'clock will take you to Saturday at 3 o'clock, which we'll co cover in a little bit, and then further on into the first day of the week, and it will all fit, as you see, as we go through all of this. So, that's something we need to realize right off the bat, that the, the, the prevailing teaching about 
Good Friday, fits with the 14th day on a Friday in 33 AD, doesn't fit, it's all a lie, it's all false. And Jesus could not have been born in 2 BC. It was in 5 BC because Herod was already dead at that time. So we want to know the truth so we don't follow any false traditions. First of all, one thing that we have pointed out, but we just need to just reiterate one thing. From God's standpoint, a day begins in the evening. It doesn't begin like we think. Genesis 1-5, each one of the days in the creation, when God called the light day and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And each one you go through Genesis 1, it always says the evening and the morning was the second day, and the evening and the morning was the third day. The day starts in the evening, which just for practical purposes would be somewhere around 6 p.m. So that's going to be important as we go through this. Now, when we look at the last week of Jesus Christ, there are so many traditions that are false. First of all, we go back to John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, we come here, verse 1. It says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which was, which had been dead, when he'd been raised from the dead. This particular day actually was on Friday, which would be Thursday night and Friday day. This is six days, and what it's speaking of here is before Israel's Passover on Nisan, Nisan day 15. You have to understand that there are two different Passovers referred to. One is the true Passover, and, which is the Lord's, and one of them it was Israel's Passover who had a different day. It was not the same. We see this is six days before speaking of Israel's Passover, and that would have been on Nisan day 15 was the day they considered that. And so six days before that would take us back to Nisan day 9. These two Passovers, we want, here's the one that you'll see this later as we go, but the Lord's Passover is not on Nisan day 15. This, instead, the Lord's Passover in Leviticus 23 verse 5 is on the 14th day of the month. The 14th day, that's when the Passover day was. The Passover lamb was killed, and then unleavened bread is what started on Nisan day 15. The 14th day of the first month, the Lord's Passover, and the 15th day began the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They had different days of the unleavened bread. Here you see it's on the 15th day. And I want to show you, this, this is not to confuse you, but to show you that there are problems in understanding things if you don't know this. Mark chapter 14, verse 12, look what it says. And the first day of unleavened bread, this is according to Israel's, when they killed the Passover. Oh, wait a minute. The Passover was killed on the day of Passover, not on the first day of unleavened bread. Remember, the Passover is the 14th day, and the first day of unleavened bread is the 15th day. And yet this says the first day of the unleavened bread when they killed the Passover because they had a different day. So you've got to understand when it's referring to the true Passover and when it's referring to it so you can understand. It looks, see, that many people thought there's so many contradictions. There are no contradictions. But you have to understand what is being said. Of course, this is wrong. It was not Israel's attitude was not the first day of unleavened bread was not when you killed the Passover. That was the day after the Passover had been killed on the 14th day. Now, we go back to John here now, and we're going to begin to go through these days. Six days before the Passover, that was from Nisan day 9. And we come then to the next one in verse 2. There they made him a supper. This was in the evening. When does the day begin? In the evening. So this is now coming to the next day, which would be Nisan day 10. Nisan day 10, the following day, which begins with a Friday night and ends on a Saturday day. 
So what day, what is that? That's the Sabbath day, isn't it? So he made him a supper. Martha served him. Lazarus was one of them that sat at table with him. And what was happening this particular day? This is where Mary took the pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house is filled with the odor of the ointment. And, and uh, then we come down to verse 7, and it says what Jesus said, what was going on. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my burying has she kept this. Otherwise, he was being anointed for his burial at that time. So this is happening on Nisan day 10. What else do we see that was mentioned in the Word of God about what would happen on the 10th day of the first month? We have to go back to Exodus chapter 12, and we look in verse 3. He said, Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the 10th day of this month, this is the first month, Nisan, they shall take to them every man a lamb, a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Well, who's the lamb? Jesus. He's being taken here on, the, as all of a type pointing towards him on the tenth day as he was presenting himself. If the house will be too little for the lamb, let him his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. And notice what they said, verse 5, the lamb shall be without blemish. Jesus, of course, is the one who fulfilled this. He's the one who was out blemish. A male the first year, and you take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Now, what would they do? They shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. So, they take this on the 10th day, and they're going to be examining it for four days to be sure it's without blemish to the 14th day. What's the 14th day? That's the day the Passover lamb is going to be killed. That is the Lord's Passover on Nisan day 14. So, the Saturday Sabbath was the 10th, and then we have the 11th would be like the Monday, the 12th would be Tuesday, the uh, 13th would be, or Monday, and then thir 13th would be Tuesday, Sunday, Monday, then Tuesday, and then the 14th day would be Wednesday. So, we see also another point here. When it says you keep it up in the 14th day of the same month, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it. Now it says kill it in the evening. It's not a good translation because in the Hebrew, it doesn't mean in the evening. Instead, it means between the evenings as Young's translates and other translations have translated it. Why is that so? Because the evening started like at 6 p.m. When was Jesus killed? He was killed in the day, not in the evening. Therefore, this is not talking about that he was killed in the evening as far as, because the word's truth and it's going to be performed exactly. It's talking about between the evenings, which means it had to happen in the daytime. And so, this means that on the 14th day, during the daytime, that is when the lamb was killed. And of course, that's exactly what happened to Jesus, as you will see. Now, we see here, we're going back to John chapter 12 now. In John chapter 12, we see he presented himself on the 10th day, and we come down to verse 12. Remember, the evening was the beginning of the day, and now we're talking about the daytime part of that day. The next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Here, Jesus is coming in. He's presenting himself as the Lamb of God and the one who is going to be the king, not a physical king, but bring forth the spiritual kingdom that was going to come into manifestation. Jesus, when he'd found the young ass, sat there upon, as it's written, that fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. And this is from a prophecy that was given back in Zechariah. If we go over to Zechariah 9, verse 9, you'll see this. Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. 
He's just or righteous, having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon the col a colt, the fowl of an ass. Jesus was fulfilling this as he came in on that particular day. Now, when he came into that, then remember what does tradition say this was? They say it was Palm Sunday. Was it Sunday? No, it was the 10th day on the Sabbath because then there was the 11th Sunday, the 12th Monday, the 13th Tuesday, and the 14th, which was Wednesday, which is Nisan 14, the day that he was crucified. So the Palm Sunday is a false teaching. He didn't come in on Sunday. Instead, he came in on Saturday, the Sabbath day. It's important to understand. Well, let's go over now to in Mark, and we're going to look a lot in Mark, and chapter 11. We see here's when he came forth initially to, uh, to Jerusalem, sent forth to his disciples. And remember, they went over there and they found the colt that was tied, that we just saw the prophecy that he that was coming in on a colt. And they found the colt and brought him in there. And so they brought the colt to Jesus, cast their garments on him, and he sat upon them, spread their garments in the way, cut down the branches off the trees, strawed them in the way. And they that went before him followed, cried, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So this is all happening in the daytime part of Nisan day 10. So, he's blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. So Jesus enters into Jerusalem, he goes into the temple, and when he looked around upon all those things, now the eventide was come, so this is, means this is going to be the beginning of the next day. He went out into Bethany with the twelve. So day 10 is over, and now we're into day 11 in the evening. He goes to Bethany, and then it jumps to the next day. So he's there in Bethany for the evening. We're still on day 11, which would be the Sunday. On the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered, said to it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. Or literally it means to the age, aeon, not forever. I'll tell you why that's so. It's important you understand it's to the age. Because who's the fig tree nation? The Jews. Did the Jews receive the gospel? or the, the word that he was bringing forth? No, they rejected it. There was no fruit from his ministry of three and a half years to the Jews. And so he's declaring that. And now what happened? Because they rejected it, what was going to happen? They, he, he, God's dealing with the Jews. Remember, we've talked about this before, but in Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, where there were seven, 69 weeks until Messiah came, which started in 458 B.C. with the, the decree by Artaxerxes about the restoring of the city and the temple. We see that from that date, from 458 B.C., 69 weeks, which is 483 years, brought it to 26 A.D., which is when Jesus began his ministry. And he ministered for three and a half years. So three and a half years is a half of a week, because a week is seven years. So 69 and a half weeks were elapsed. And that was the end of the dealing with the Jews because there's still a half week left. And when is that going to happen? It's going to happen in the tribulation when the Jews are going to be dealt with one more time and they're going to get saved this time, as it says in Romans chapter 11. So he's proclaiming the fact that the time is done with these guys because of the fact that they had not received the message that he had brought forth. And that's why it's important to realize, realize it's not forever. No, they still have three and a half years of dealings during the tribulation. That's why this means to the age, which would be what? The end, to the end of the church age until the time of the millennial age, which is when the tribulation starts and when Jesus is going to pour out the judgments as he takes back the earth. But it's also going to be the same time simultaneously when the gospel comes to the Jews again, and this time they're going to receive it, praise God. So that's why we point that out to you. It wasn't forever. So they come to Jerusalem, he goes in the temple, casts out those that 
sold, bought in the temple, overthrew the table of money changers, seated them that sold doves, wouldn't suffer any man would carry any vessel through the temple. And so he's teaching them all these things. He begins to teach them about how their house to be a house of prayer. And in verse 18, the scribes and the priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. They were examining him, looking for every reason to get at, to kill him. And so this is what he did all on Nisan day 11 as he, he was come, came into Jerusalem. When the evening was come, now we're going to switch to the next day. We finished D Nisan day 11, Sunday. Now we're going to Nisan day 12, Monday. So he goes out of the city at the time of the evening. And in the morning, now it comes the next time. Now we're at Monday morning. So they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter called into remembrance that, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And then Jesus is teaching. He's teaching about faith here in verse 22, 23, 24, and on. For, he starts teaching many different things. We come down to verse 27, and we see when he came to Jerusalem, he's walking in the temple, there came to him the chief priests, scribes, and elders. Remember what was supposed to happen from the 10th day to the 14th day? They were going to examine him. And that's what these guys were doing. They are examining him. Of course, they weren't examining him for the right reason. They weren't examining him to see if he was there without blemish and he's holy and all that. No, they were examining him so they could find some fault against him to want to kill him. Well... But this is the examination going on as Jesus is teaching the truth. And if you go through Mark chapter 12, he teaches many things. And then Mark chapter 13, he teaches from the Mount of Olives about all these things that are going to happen in the end times. And so he, he finishes up that. And let's go over to Matthew 26 for a moment from Matthew's account because we're just finishing up day 12. Chapter 26, he finished all these sayings. He says, you know that after two days is the, now look at this, notice the feast of. Look closely, you find it's italicized. Anytime you see something that's italicized, it's not in the Greek. It's been added by the translators. I put the cursor over it, you won't find anything here. On is, you find it, then you won't find anything until we get over to here. It literally says, you know that after two days, the Passover. That's why Young's translates it correctly. That's why we have it up here. So it's not talking about the feast of the Passover, which, remember, they were thinking that that was the same time as their feast, which was on the 15th day. But no, he, Jesus is talking about the real one. After two days, because we're now going from, we're on... Um, at the, the time when we've come into the next day, remember, that we have two days, which would be the Monday and the Tuesday. After those two days, we come to Wednesday is the Passover. And that's the Lord's Passover when he was going to be crucified. And the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. So he's identifying the true Passover, which is the Lord's Passover, the real one. We just thought we'd show that to you. And let's go over to Mark's account again. In Mark 14, we'll see the same thing. After two days was, again, notice the feast of is italicized, not there in the Greek. After two days was the Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might take them by craft and, and put them to death. So here, again, this is talking about the the Passover, and then the unleavened bread that was going to follow after that. So we're at the end now of day 12, end of day 12, which was that Monday. Because remember, it's after two days. So we finished this up, and now we got two days till the time of the Passover. We come to Nisan day 13. And this is going to be here. Of course, they said not on the feast, referring to that the uproar of the people. Verse 3. Being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of, of ointment of spikenard, very precious, break the box and poured it on his head. And this is in the evening, so this is now the beginning of Nisan day 13, which would have been on Tuesday, because now they're at, here in the night at the house of Simon the leper. And, um, of course, they were all murmuring against her and so forth. 
And he, of course, she said she's come to anoint my body for the bearing as well. So we now come down further and we come to verse 12. In the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover. So whose unleavened bread are they talking about? Well, did you kill the Passover on unleavened bread? No. You kill the Passover on the Lord's Passover on the 14th day. What's the next day? Unleavened bread's on the 15th day, the Lord's Pass Feast of Passover. So this is talking about Israel's. And see, if you don't understand that, you can get confused and think there's some contradiction here, but there isn't. The first day of the unleavened bread, according to the Jews, when they killed the Passover, because they thought that, they considered that the first day. As the disciples said, where we go, we go and prepare that we may eat the Passover. See, if we're going to go and eat the Passover and we're going to kill the Passover, it means it hadn't happened yet. And yet they're talking about unleavened bread being on that day. So you know it's wrong because it's contrary to Leviticus chapter 23. These guys were off. So, of course, what do they do? They send the fourth of two disciples and to go and they're going to find this place where they're going to make ready. They find this large upper room and to prepare this, this Passover that they're the time which is going to, the, this is now the time when it would be approaching the day of Passover, which would be on the beginning at the day of Nisan 14, which would be in the evening. So here during the day of the 13, though, day 13, they're going to find this place. Disciples went forth, came in the city, found as he had said to them, and they made ready the Passover. Now, in the evening, so what now? We've, we switch to a new day now. What day is this? This is now day 14, Nisan day 14, which would be Wednesday, which begins in the evening prior to that. So in the evening, he cometh with the twelve. And this is, uh, of course, the, the true Passover time. And he sat and did eat. And Jesus said, I say unto you, every one of you, one of you which eateth with me shall betray me. He's pointing all those things out. And as he's telling them these things, we, we see in verse 21, he's speaking about the Son of Man being betrayed. And then we see in verse 22 something. As they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave it to them and take, said, take, eat, this is my body. Is that what they did when they had the Passover meal in the Old Testament era? No. They had what's called the Passover Seder. And yet here he's talking about something different. Let me comment about the Passover Seder. The Passover Seder was a Jewish ritual feast. It was retelling the story of their liberation of the Israelites from Egypt, their slavery in Egypt. Everything that they were doing on Passover that they were speaking of was fulfilled by Jesus Christ becoming the Passover lamb who, of course, became sin. Now, there are Christians today that want to keep this and take, have this, observe this Passover Seder. That's wrong. It's an abomination to do that. It's actually a denial of Jesus Christ. Because what do we do? We now take communion, which is what Jesus is talking about. Take, eat my body. He's telling there's a change. You're not going to be doing this Passover Seder anymore. You're now going to be instead taking communion. And he's beginning to, he's pointing that out, as you will read here in a moment. So, what he's bringing the revelation here is that there was a replacement of the Passover Seder with the communion. Let's read for a second here. He took the cup when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. He said, this is the blood of my New Testament, which is shed for many. Let's go over to Luke's account for a moment here. In Luke chapter 22, we pick up in verse 13. Here they went, found as they had said unto him, made ready the Passover. Hour comes, he sits down with the twelve disciples. And notice what he says, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, which would be before he went to the cross, so the last time. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof, of the Passover meal, that Seder that they did in the Old Testament, until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God, because he was going to bring the kingdom of God into manifestation. 
He took the cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. And he said, I say, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. So he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And also the cup after the supper said, This cup's the New Testament on my blood, which is shed for you. So what is he doing? Again, here in Luke's account, he's showing, We're not gonna, I'm not going to be drinking this anymore because there's going to be a fulfillment of the kingdom of God, which is bringing the rule and the reign of God into manifestation. And what is going to happen now? They're talking about something. He's talking about something they didn't know anything about. This is my body, broken, just given for you, due in remembrance of me. And the cup, this is the cup of the New Testament, my blood shed for you. That had nothing to do with the Old Testament Passover Seder. The Passover Seder was an Old Testament observance, and it essentially was what they were doing, looking for Jesus to come. Of course, Jesus is saying that this isn't so anymore. We don't keep this any longer. You're not going to be keeping this any longer because of the fulfillment that is going to happen of bringing the kingdom of God and the fulfillment of all that it was pointing towards. What the Passover Seder was, was a ritual pointing towards the coming of the Messiah. And they would have all these places. They, have a, they had the door open. They had a place for Elijah to come in who was going to be announcing that he was coming in and they was all looking for the Messiah to come. That was all what it was about. The Seder was used by the Jews to be keep looking for the Messiah. That's what they would do all the time. In fact, the Seder wasn't even existent, actually in existence in the time of Jesus. They came and, and developed that after in later centuries under the rabbinic thought of the Jews. But what the Seder does, or this, the meal that they have, was it ignores the death of Christ and the fulfillment of it and ignores the Last Supper because they're going to eat bitter herbs and, and different things. No, we're not going to have any more bitter herbs or uh, eat, eat a, a lamb and so forth as far as physical and do all these physical things. They also drank wine at that time. And the Seder was all concerned with the fact of the, they had come out of Egypt and they talked about their departure out of Egypt and they were looking forward for Elijah to come and announce the Messiah whenever he would come. And that's what they're doing every year. So can a Christian today be involved in that? No. It's actually a denial that Jesus has come. Yet it's astounding that Christians will want to keep this Passover Seder type of a meal, which is all a lie. We should have nothing to do with it whatsoever. Anybody that does that, they must realize it's actually a denial of what Jesus Christ accomplished. That's, of course, why he, what's he showing? He's showing there's a change in this thing. You're not going to be doing this any longer looking for him to come. He's already come, and his body is, is broken, and his, the blood was shed, which brought the New Testament. They knew nothing about a New Testament. He's speaking about the New Testament that was coming into manifestation. Now, Let's go back to Mark, chapter 14, and we'll pick up in verse 26. After they had finished that, what did he do? He sang a hymn, went out in the Mount of Olives. This is still Nisan, day 14, in the evening, remember? And so then the next thing that happened, they came to Gethsemane, where Jesus is, where they're praying, and that goes on for a while. And then we come down to verse 43, and after he had finished praying, that's when Judas comes here, immediately while he spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, with them a great multitude, swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. They're coming to get him now, to take him to the cross. And so he that betrayed him, you know, came and gave him the token, saying, whoever I shall kiss, the same as he, take him and lead him away safely. So he came to betray him. So this has all happened in the evening. Chapter 15, verse 1, straightway in the morning, and this is not actually talking about morning in, after 6 a.m. This is talking about in the middle of the night. This is pro-E. You're going to see this later, but it's the fourth watch of the night from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock in the morning, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., and this is an important word that you'll see something a little bit later. 
So from 3 to 6, this is when they brought Jesus to Pilate. And so they have the mock trial before him, all these different things that they do. And then we come down to verse 22. After all that, and he, they, 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 he said, I find no fault in him. And they say, well, no, they wanted to crucify him. And he gave him into their hands, and they're taking him away now to Golgotha. They bring him to the place of Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And so, now we come to verse 24. They put him on the cross. When they crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon him, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. The third hour would be at 9 a.m. in the morning. 9 a.m., and that is the exact time when they, would crucify, when they would kill the Passover lamb year after year after year. On that very same hour, he did things exactly at the time. So they crucified him. We come down to verse 33. When the sixth hour was come, which would be noon, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. That would be noon to 3 o'clock. What does the darkness symbolize? The fact that he was made sin. All the sin of mankind was laid upon him at that time. Now, this is the same thing that was said. We need to show you this for a moment to answer in a contradiction that, appear, that people have thought so, but it's not one. Matthew 27, 45 also says from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land to the ninth hour. And in Luke's account, it says the same thing in Luke chapter 23, over in verse 44. It was the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth till the ninth hour. So when's the sixth hour of the ninth hour? Twelve noon to three o'clock. And we see it speaking of the sixth hour. Now, in John's account, there's something different that's declared. Because that's when he already was on the cross for three hours and then darkness for three hours after that. In John's account, he's not talking about the time that they were talking about. Because in verse 13, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought forth Jesus, sat down in the judgment seat in a place called the pavement. In the, in the Hebrew, this is when he's going to be giving them into their hands to take them to the cross. It was the preparation of the Passover. And about the sixth hour, he says to the Jews, Behold your king. Now, wait a minute. We already knew the sixth hour was, he's already on the cross for three hours. And this is talking about the sixth hour. And that's when there was darkness for three hours. But this is talking about the sixth hour when he's given him into the hands of the Jews. This is before he got to the cross. What's this all talking about? It looks like a contradiction, but it's not. The sixth hour that it's speaking here, John is speaking about Roman time. Not what the Jews' time was but the Roman time, which was at 6 a.m. in the morning, which would have been after that three hours that they had. They were presenting them before Pilate. Roman time began at midnight, like ours does. Sixth hour would have been 6 a.m. We point this out so you understand there is no contradiction. We're just talking about a different, where the, this is the Romans' time that they were speaking of. Let's go back over to Mark. Chapter 15 now, verse 34. After that, he's been made sin for three hours. What happens next? At the ninth hour, Jesus cried. And what's the ninth hour? Three o'clock in the afternoon. Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which be interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What did Jesus always call God prior to that. He always called him Father. Always. Now he's calling him God. That means he's not his Father anymore. Why? Because he was made sin, remember? And what happens when you're made sin? The Father is not going to be looking upon sin. He left him. That's why he said, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so sin was laid upon him. And what happened? Jesus was no longer in relation to God as Heavenly Father. He now was like a man who was under sin, who now was spiritually dead, having been made sin, separated from the Father, which is what spiritual death is. He was spiritually dead, separated from the Father. That's why he, at that point, 
That's how he could be taken down to hell. He had to be in that state in order to accomplish that. And remember, the devil didn't know what was going on. In fact, we'll come back to this in a moment. We went just to, we give the scripture before, but in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8, We'll verse, go back to verse 7 where it says, We speak the wisdom of God, the mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world, before the age it means, unto our glory, before the ages, it's plural, which none of the princes, or this means the rulers, none of the rulers of this age, which are all the evil spirits, knew, for had they known it, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory, because... Him becoming sin, then that's how he was able to go down into hell to pay the price of redemption, to get back the keys of hell and death from Satan, to come to the and to be able to produce the new birth, having accomplished the redemption, bringing the reconciliation, as well as to bring all those ones out of the upper compartment of hell, the Old Testament saints that were imprisoned in hell, that were stuck there. He had to go down there and reach them. So let's go back to Mark. It was a mistake. They didn't understand it. But it was the plan, of course, of what God knew, what had to be done, because who could pay the price for sin? Not man. It had to be God. That's why it was God in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. But he had to become a man, but then he had to become sin and come in the same man, state that man was in, spiritual death, in order to go and pay that price. So, we see in Mark chapter 15 now, let's go down to verse 37. Here after being made sin and the Father had left him, as we saw back here. Then in verse 37, Jesus cried with a loud voice, having been made sin, and gave up the ghost. By the way, he didn't die by crucifixion because crucifixion is called death by inches in which you're nailed up there and your feet are nailed and you keep pushing up trying to get your breath and finally you can't get your breath anymore and you suffocate. That's what, it's a cruel death. Sometimes people were put up there and they were up there for days even before they would even die depending upon their level of strength. He gave a, if you're on your last breath, you don't have a loud voice. He simply was made sin and he gave up, he, with a loud voice, he gave up his spirit, having been made sin. And doing so, what happened? He was the final sacrifice for sin. And look what happened when that happened, when, that, when he did that. Mark 15, 38, the veil of the temple, even though he wasn't in the temple, Nonetheless, he was the sacrifice for all the sins of mankind on the cross. The veil of the temple was rent from the twain, been twain in two, from the top to the bottom. That was supernatural. This temple, in the temple, the, the curtain, the veil they had was like 18, 20 feet high and it was real thick because they were afraid of the presence of God and they had it so thick so, you know, nobody could ever even do anything with it. Well, it was supernaturally ripped in two from the top to the bottom by the presence of God. Why? Because the final sacrifice was done. There was no more. That was it. God left the Old Testament temple. That's it. It's done. Never to be there again. And he's not. He never was in the Old Testament temple after that. The final sacrifice occurred. So this is what we see happening. And this is at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now... By the way, we see the women saw where his tomb was and everything uh, as he, they watched, watched what was happening. In verse 42, now when the even was come, the time when this, and this means at the time, it can mean from 6 to later, but it can also mean from 3 to 6, which is what it will refer here, because at 3 o'clock when he died, and then remember they, came, they were amazed that he was dead already, because you know, it's death by inches, you know. I can remember, they, they came to break, the, they had to get them all down before 6 o'clock, which was the next day, which is what? That was a beginning of the unleavened bread, which was a Sabbath, 
a special high Sabbath that week. They had to get these guys out of there. That's why they came and broke the legs of the malefactors next to them. And they came to Jesus to break his legs, and he's already dead. They were amazed. You already had given up the ghost. So, when this time came, because it was the preparation, the Jews' preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath. Now, what Sabbath are we talking about? People have thought that that's talking about the weekly Sabbath. It is not talking about the weekly Sabbath. This is talking about the high special Sabbath, which was on Nisan day 15, according to God's reckoning time, which is that Thursday. That was the first day of unleavened bread was a Sabbath. In fact, we'll come back here in a moment. We'll just show you from Leviticus. In Leviticus chapter 23, when it talks about this, and there's the 14th day, there's the 15th day, and it says the first day you'll have a holy convocation. You should do no servile work therein because it was a, a, it was a holy day. That was a Sabbath day. So the first day was a Sabbath day, and that's why they had to get all those guys off the cross right away. So we're now at the end of the 14th day, the day before the Sabbath. Now, that also is important to understand because they thought it was Friday before a Saturday Sabbath. That's another reason why people have believed that Jesus died on Friday, because they figured that this had to refer to the Saturday Sabbath, but it didn't. They missed the whole boat, and we'll show you what that happened. Well, first of all, of course, what did they do? He went and got craved the body of Pilate, uh, from, Pilate, from Pilate the body of Jesus, and of course he was amazed that he was already dead, and so he gave the body to, jo to Joseph when he knew it of the centurion, and here he comes and they put him in the tomb. Okay, now over in Luke's account, chapter 23, we come over to verse 53. They took it down, wrapped it in linen, laid it in the sepulcher that was hewn in stone, never any man before was laid. That day was the preparation, same thing we saw before, and the Sabbath drew on. Which Sabbath? Not the Saturday Sabbath, but the special Sabbath on the 15th day, which was the first day of unleavened bread according to God's reckoning. Now, where can we see something that really shows this? Yeah, John's account points it out. John 19, we come down to verse 30. When Jesus received the vinegar, he said, it's finished. By the way, what was finished? Not all the things that he was going to do. People say, oh, it's finished. He accomplished the redemption and everything is done. No, it wasn't. All that was finished was he was the final sacrifice because he had to go down to hell for three days and three nights. There were a lot of things he had to do. He had to pay the price. He, he got born from the dead down there, as you'll see in a moment. He went back and took the keys of hell and death from the devil. He went and preached the gospel to those guys. There were a lot of things that still were to be done. So it wasn't finished. What was finished was the final sacrifice done. No more sacrifices for sin. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost because he now was the one who was the sin offering. Verse 31, the Jews therefore, because it was the preparation, remember we've heard about this preparation, that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. And then it tells you what Sabbath day it's referring to. For that Sabbath day was a high day, a special day, not the normal weekly Sabbath. And that high day was Nisan day 15, which is Thursday, which was the first day of unleavened bread. So, we have now finished up Nisan day 14, and we're into day, now Nisan day 15, which was a Sabbath day when they had the rest. But what do we see that happened? The Jews were afraid of what was going to happen. So the next day that followed the day of preparation, the preparation day was the 14th day, remember? The next day, that's the Sabbath day. Are they resting? No. <laughs> the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate because they were worried about something here. 
saying, Sir, we remember that deceiver said, While he's yet alive, after three days I'll rise again. Command, therefore, the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He's risen from the dead, so the last arrow will be worse than the first. And, of course, he wasn't going to go for that. Pilate said, You have a watch. Go your way. Make it as sure as you can. But this is what happened on that Thursday while everybody else is resting on the first day on that high day, the Sabbath day of the first day of unleavened bread, which was on Thursday. So they ended up making the sepulchre sure, sure and sealing the stone and setting a watch. Now let's go back over to Mark 15, and we're going to come to the next day, Mark 15, verse 47. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, beheld where he was laid. So they saw what happened when he laid him in the tomb. And when the Sabbath was passed, what Sabbath? That high Sabbath. Not the weekly Sabbath. The high Sabbath was passed. Thursday's done, the day they rest. Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, Shalom, had bought sweet spices they might come and anoint him. Now there's a problem here in the King James. When it says had bought, it sounds like they already had done it previously. If it was had bought, in the Greek that would have to be what's called a pluperfect tense, which is translated had bought, something completed and done in the past. When we look at this verb, it is not a pluperfect tense. It is an aorist tense, which is a simple past tense. The way you would translate it in Greek is when they came, they bought sweet spices. Not that they had bought. They hadn't done anything yet because the Sabbath they were arresting. When the Sabbath was passed, they bought. This is why Young's translates it correctly. They bought spices that they might come and annoy him. And what were they doing? They bought all these spices and they had to go and they had to prepare them. And that's what they bought them on Friday now. We're on Nissan day, on Friday, day 16. And so they bought them and then they had to go and to, to prepare these. We come to Luke chapter 23 now, as we're looking at all this to see this clearly. So they bought the spices on Friday and they're preparing them. We come down to verse 54. That day was the preparation. Sabbath drew on, drew on. That's the high month Sabbath then. The women also, which came with them from Galilee, followed him beyond the, behold the sepulcher, how his body was laid. So she, they knew all about that. Remember it said in the other account, they bought the spices. And this, this doesn't say they bought them, but it tells you what they did once they bought them. What did they do? They returned and prepared the spices and the ointments. Well, before you can prepare them, you've got to buy them. So the other account said they bought them, and this is telling you what they did once they bought them. They returned with the spices that they bought all on Friday and prepared the spices and the ointments that took them all day to get that ready, and they were going to bring that back. But what did they, when they finished that, what did they do next? <coughs> this is on Friday. <coughs> They rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So Friday they buy them and they're preparing these spices, which is a, a lengthy process. And they finish that because they didn't bring them back to them yet. Now they have to rest on the Sabbath day. And what day is that? That is the Saturday. So the 16th day is the day they bought the spices, prepared them, and now they finish that. And now they're resting on the Sabbath day. <clears throat> which is Nisan day 17, that Saturday. Now, we come to Luke 24, 1. Now, upon the first of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher, bringing the spices that they prepared. So they hadn't brought the spices before. They were just preparing them before. And we know this is after the Sabbath, so that meant, obviously, they didn't come on Friday to bring the spices. This is afterwards. So they bring in the spice they prepared and certain others with them and they found the stone stole, rolled away from the sepulcher. So this is now on after 
that it, the, the weekly Sabbath. So now we're on the first of the week, which is Sunday or Nisan Day uh, 18 <clears throat> on Sunday. And so they found the thing, of course, stole, uh, rolled away, and he entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, let's go over to Mark's account, 16. Here, it talks about they bought the sweet spices. When was that? On Friday. Remember, they went and they returned and prepared them all day Friday. Then we have the Saturday Sabbath. There's a time frame between verse 1 and verse 2. Because verse 1 happened on Friday. Verse 2. Early in the morning, the first day of the week. Well, remember, they rested the Sabbath day in between. So you, can't, you don't think it's not happened the next day. There was a day in between that's not brought up here. It is in the other account. But so they bought them on the Friday. They rested the Sabbath day that the other one account said. And now we're talking about what they did on the first day of the week. They came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they're, what are they doing? They're bringing these spices that they, they had prepared. And they, want, they heard about rolling away the stone of the sepulcher, and they saw the stone was already rolled away. And they saw the young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. That was an angel. And he, of course, he told them that Jesus had been, has risen. His body's not there any longer. Now, this brings us to another point. Jesus was to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Where did Jesus go when he died? Did he go to heaven? No. He went down to hell to pay the price for sin. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, when he went up to heaven, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. This was later. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? So before he went up, he went down for three days and three nights into the lower parts of the earth. And what did he do? <clears throat> he went down to hell. We know that because of many scriptures, but we're, let's look at a couple of them. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 24, God raised up, having loosed the pains of death. It wasn't possible that he should be holding of it. Where was he experiencing that? Down in hell. Verse 27, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. That's where he was. Spirit and soul went to hell. Neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. See, in this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So he goes to hell. He's down there. Not only was he paying the price for sin for three days and three nights and accomplishing the redemption, but what else was he doing? He was getting to him who had the power of death, the devil, after he had accomplished that. Hebrews 2.14 indicates this. For as much as the children were partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He was able to do that and accomplish that. And we know what he did after he had accomplished the redemption. He was able to take back the keys of hell and death because he says so in Revelation 1.18. I am he that liveth, and was dead. So he's dead, and he goes down to hell for three days and three nights. And behold, I'm alive evermore, forevermore. Well, that meant something happened to them, which we'll comment in a moment, which, which will, it's, he got born again. The first person born again. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. When he went down to hell, he paid that price. And what happened? He had to get born from the dead, because remember, he was spiritually dead, and he was in the place that man was in, in spiritual death, having been made sin, paying the price, because he was the lamb, who was a lamb when he went, but he became a serpent, remember, on the cross, and then he went down and paid that price in hell. Acts 13, 29 says, When they laid 
They had fulfilled all that was written of him. They took him down from the tree, laid him in the sepulcher. God raised him from the dead. Seen many days, he came up from Galilee, Jerusalem, who was witnesses unto the people. We declare the glad tidings, how the promise that was made unto the fathers, God fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he raised up Jesus again, as written in the second psalm. And what, how did he raise him? Look what it says. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That means born. Well, that's how Jesus came back to be in relationship with the Father. Because remember, he was not a father and son to him any longer. Now he says, you're my son. How did he get it back in that place? He got born again. Jesus was the first one who was born from the dead. We know this from Revelation 1, verse 5. Jesus Christ is the faithful witness and the first begotten. This means the firstborn. When it says of, it literally means out of. It's the word ek, out of. The firstborn out of what? The dead. And when it's talking about the dead, it doesn't mean the dead state. Instead, it means where all the dead people were. How do you know? Because the word dead, when you look at it in the Greek, it is plural. It is an adjective, and the way you would, not a noun, an adjective that would be plural will be translated the dead ones. Where were all the dead ones? In hell. Jesus was down there with them. He's the firstborn out of the dead ones. He was born from spiritual death unto spiritual life. And why did that have to happen? Because man had to get a new spirit. And who could do that? Only God could do it. But how could that happen? God had to get a new spirit for man so that he could get a new spirit. So who got the new spirit for him? Jesus. He was the first born from spiritual death to spiritual life. Look at what it says in Hebrews 1, verse 5. Which of the angels said at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, or born you. And again I'll be to him a father, and he'll be to me a son. Well, again, that means he must not have been at one point. That's right, he was God, and he was spiritually dead, remember. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He left him. I'll be to him a father, he'll be to me a son. And then look what it says. And again, when he bringeth in the firstborn, notice the word, first begotten, firstborn, so that's talking about Jesus. And when did he become a firstborn? Down in hell after those three days and three nights. Into what? Into the world. What does the word world mean? The inhabited earth. Not cosmos for world. When did Jesus come into, was born into the inhabited earth. He was born down in hell. He comes back into the inhabited earth. When he comes back, and gets his body. This is talking about after he came up out of hell. He says, let all the angels of God worship him because, of course, now he had accomplished the redemption and he had been born again in hell after the three days and the three nights. And we see other, some other scriptures we can just couple we'll look at that will help you on this. Colossians 1.15, look what it says. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn, speaking of Jesus, of every or all creation. Because man was dead. What did, he, what, what did he have to have? He had to get a new spirit and a new heart that was prophesied by Ezekiel. Well, how is he going to get it? Man couldn't get it. Only God could do it. But the only way God could do it is he had to become a man to be in man's place and pay the redemption. Not only did he pay the redemptive price, but he also accomplished the reconciliation, which is the exchange, getting a brand new spirit by spiritual birth. And that's what happened. He's the firstborn of all creation because everything had to be recreated. Man had to be, have a recreation of a brand new spirit. And so Jesus is the one who did it. And, of course, in doing so also, he founded the church and the body of Christ. Look what it says in verse 18. He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn, out of, ek, not from, but out of, more literally, the dead ones. Again, 
plural, adjective, all the dead people that were all down in hell. That in all things he might have the preeminence. So, that means now that Jesus was the first born from the dead. He was able to take back the keys of hell and of death and having accomplished the redemption. Now, there's many scriptures that we want to comment on throughout the Word that talk about how he was raised the third day. And we need to discuss this for a moment before we finish. I'll just show you some of them. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4. He was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. We'll look over in Luke. We're going to show you a few of these. 9.22. Son of man must suffer many things, be rejected, rejected of the elders, chief priests, scribes, be slain, killed, and be raised the third day. It says it time after time after time, always saying the third day. Here's 18.33. They'll scourge him, put him to death, and the third day shall rise again. Here's another one in Luke 24.7. Son of man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Verse 21. We trust that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel, and besides this, today is the third day since these were done. They all expected that everything was going to be accomplished by then. Mark's account, same thing. Chapter 9, verse 31. Taught his disciples, said, The Son of Man is delivered in the hands of men. They'll kill him, and after he's killed, he shall rise the third day. Now, what day did he die? Wednesday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday is the third day. Well, that means he rose the third day. That's Saturday. How long was he in the tomb, or in hell? For 72 hours, three days and three nights. Three o'clock on Wednesday, to Thursday, to Friday, to three o'clock on Saturday. Where is he though? He's down in hell. What's the first thing that happened to Jesus after he had accomplished that? He was spiritually born, raised from spiritual death to spiritual life by being born again. That's what it's talking about that happened on the third day. It's talking about the spiritual rising from the dead on the third day, not getting his physical body. This has received many people, and even those to try to say that that it was the third day that he got his body and came up out of there. Not so. It was the third day when he got born again and came out from spiritual, this is talking about spiritual life, risen from spiritual death to spiritual life, the third day. And that is important because what happened then? Remember, he, after that, he takes back the keys of hell and death. He had to have dealt with the devil down there. But what else did he do? Did he come right up out of there immediately? No. Because 1 Peter chapter 3 tells us something in verse 19. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Who is in prison? Everybody. But who are the spirits in prison that he is preaching to? the ones in Abraham's bosom in the upper compartment of hell that were the Old Testament saints that were accounted as righteous, but every day were still spiritually dead because nobody, was, nobody had a spirit that was right with God. Why did they, they have to hear something? Because can anybody come out of hell without having a right spirit? No. They were doomed forever in hell. So he's preaching something to them. What's he preaching to them? The gospel to them. 1 Peter 4, 6. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. Where? In hell. The upper compart of hell. After Jesus had been born from spiritual death to spiritual life, he goes and preaches to them that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. And you better know they all received Jesus and got born again. 
So the whole group got born again. That took some time. How long? It took a period of time, that's for sure, before he came up. And then he, when he came up, what happened when he's coming up? He's bringing those guys up with him. You've got to understand what's going on here in Matthew 27 as well. Matthew 27, let's look first of all in verse 50. Here's Jesus on the cross. Matthew is viewing things from earth's perspective, what he sees, not what went on down in hell for three days and three nights. He cries with a loud voice. He yields up the ghost. The way all the temples rent in twain, from top to bottom, earth did quake, rocks rent. That's what happened on earth. Look at what happened in the next verse. Because three days and three nights occurred in between after this. But the next verse says, The graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. When was that? That was after three days and three nights, after he accomplished the redemption, was born again, and had preached the gospel to all these guys. And now they're coming up out of there. This is three days later. There's a time lapse between the two. This is simply the view on earth of what happened. So, they came out of the graves after his resurrection. You know that's what it's talking about and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, people still say, well, it was the third day, and they think he got his body on the third day. No, he didn't get his body on the third day. Mark chapter 16, verse 9. Look what it says. Now, when Jesus, referring to him, was risen, let's look at this for a moment, this is in the Greek. This is the word here now. This is in what's called the nominative case in the Greek, which means it would be the subject of the thing. That's why Young's translates it with a he as a subject. And it is a participle, aorist active participle. The way you would translate that is having risen. So this is the way this should be translated. He having risen when? In the morning, the morning, well, that wouldn't be at 3 o'clock on Saturday afternoon. And when is the morning? This word morning is this word that's translated early in the King James. It's the word proe, but here it is, proe. That's, that pi is a p. The thing that looks like a, a p is actually a, a rho in Greek, r, and that's uh, the omega, which is an O, it's, that's why it's, it's actually, if you can even see it, if I put it over here, see this same word here? Proe. That's the Greek word. And here it is. I'm putting the cursor over here. You can see it. So, he, having risen, when? The fourth watch of the night from 3 o'clock until 6 o'clock. When? The first of the week. Ah, oh, so when did Jesus get his body? He got his body at 3 a.m., more than likely, around that time, on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, because what was he doing all the rest of the time from 3 p.m. on Saturday? He's down there taking back the keys of hell and death, dealing with the devil and preaching the gospel to all those guys, and then they all came up there on the first day of the week. So everybody that tries to say that he got his body during the time on the, on the uh, 3 o'clock is error. In fact, think about it. If he had got his body at 3 o'clock, everybody would have seen, you know, that was before the night came. Nobody saw anything because he was still down in hell carrying things on. So when was Jesus got his body? This tells you. He having risen... 3 o'clock to 6, probably 3 o'clock, the first of the week. So all those people out there that say that Jesus got his body after three days and three nights, which is all the Jewish type people and messianics and stuff, you're all wrong because it's talking about spiritual birth that happened at 3 o'clock after 72 hours on the third day, not when he got his physical body. His physical body he didn't get until 3 a.m. on the first day of the week. That answers that question that many people have had. And it destroys 
the lying teaching that people have had. And one of the reasons is because they like to, they don't want to think that Jesus could have gotten his body on the first day of the week because they want it to be on the third day, which is the Saturday Sabbath, because they want to keep their Sabbath, you know. We're not under the Old Testament any longer. There is no physical Sabbath in the New Testament. It's all a spiritual Sabbath that we enter into the spiritual rest as we possess the promises of God. No, Jesus did not get his body on the Saturday Sabbath. He got his body on the first of the week, which answers that question and shows the fact that's why the, it would show all these, these things, the fact that the Old Testament's done, final sacrifice is done. He didn't, he, the third day was spiritual birth from death unto life. Then he preaches the gospel to those guys and they all come about. He gets his body then. That's when he got the, his body at that time. And that is important, of course, then what did he do? You know, first person, he, before he went up to heaven with it, which is what he did, we see in John uh, 20, verse 17, if we go back, this is when um, here he comes and the, they look, he's, he's looking for the body of Jesus, didn't find it. And she says, woman, why weepest thou? And he said, because they take away my Lord. I know not where he laid him. And when she said that, she turned herself back, saw Jesus standing, knew not that it was Jesus. He said to her, Woman, why weepest thou? Why seekest thou? She supposed him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where you have laid him, and I'll take him away. And that's when he turned to her and he said, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Ah. And now he knew who it was. She said, Mary. He said, Mary. And she turned, says, Master, so she sees who he is. And of course, this is before he'd gone to heaven. He says, touch me not. He didn't want to be touched or contaminated by any human because he had to go up and take his blood up to heaven to pour it out on the mercy seat and cleanse everything in heaven. It all had to be cleansed because of all of the sin from the, the angels of what they had done up there. Touch me not. I'm not ascended to my father, but go to my brother and say unto my son and to my father and your father and to my God and your God. And that also shows you that Jesus had come back into relationship with the Father because he was bo first born from the dead. And he was his Father now again. Jesus accomplished this great work. Well, the summary is this. On the ninth day when he comes is a Friday. The tenth day, which was Saturday, that's when he presented himself as the Lamb and the King. Not on Palm Sunday. It's a lie. On the eleventh day, 12th day, 13th day, this is where he was being examined up to the 14th day. The lamb was examined to the 14th day. The Last Supper in the evening, this is where Judas betrays him. This is, the, of course, where he reveals to them that there's a change from the, pa of the Passover celebration, that they were looking for the Messiah, the Passover meal. Now it's going to be changed to communion. Because my body is going to be broken for you and my blood is poured out. And he said, the, the New Testament, meaning the New Testament is going to come into being. And so here he's made, he's of course sent to Pilate. They come and crucify, or they come and arrest him with Judas betraying him. They send him to Pilate. He gets crucified on the cross at 9 a.m. He's made sin from 12 to 3. The father forsook him at that point, having been made sin. He gives up the ghost. He goes down for three days and three nights into hell, and that's the 15th, 16th, and 17th days until three o'clock in the afternoon on the Saturday when he is spiritually born from spiritual death unto spiritual life. And as we saw, that the things about the Passover, there was the Lord's Passover, the real one on the 14th day, and Israel's Passover, which was the, a, diff, a different time they declared it. And that's why there's some confusion unless you understand what's being said. And remember, there was a special high Sabbath that day, that week, in the 15th day on a Thursday. The women buy the sp spices on the 15th, excuse me, on the 16th day, Friday, and they prepare them. And then they rest on the Sabbath day, which is the 17th day, the Saturday. And then they come the next day with all the spices they prepared. And Jesus is already raised from the dead bodily, having been done at 3 a.m. on the first day of the week when he got his body. 
and he had already had been down for three days and three nights and been the firstborn from the dead down in hell, preached the gospel to all those ones in the upper compartment of hell. They all came up out of there having gotten born again and they had their bodies, were, the graves were open, even the people saw their bodies. That would have been the next day during the time of the day and that would have been during that first day of the week in Jesus. Then he went up to heaven himself and poured out his blood on the mercy seat and cleansed everything in there and then he came back for 40 days and 40 nights revealing himself unto the disciples before he goes back to heaven. He's inaugurated as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and then 10 days later that's when the day of Pentecost occurs and the Holy Spirit is poured out and it's the birthday of the church on earth who are now get born again and it begins the church age for the next 2,000 years, which we only have eight more years till the end of it. Praise God for the mighty work that Jesus accomplished. That is the information about the chronology of the last week of Jesus. It answers all the questions. It answers any of the supposed contradictions. There aren't any. You just have to understand a few of the things that are being said, which we pointed out. I trust this has been a help to you. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the revelation of the chronology of the last week of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished. I thank you that I see it clearly and I understand the scriptures are correct. There are no contradictions. It is exactly as it said. And Jesus Christ was the firstborn from the dead and then he got his body on the first day of the week at 3 a.m. I thank you. I understand this now and I will not be confused. I see the traditions of men that are false. He didn't die on Friday. He died on Wednesday. It wasn't 33 A.D. It was 30 A.D. when Nisan 14 was on a Wednesday and the three days and three nights takes it to the Saturday. I thank you for the truth of the chronology of the last week of Jesus Christ. The word is so. There's no contradiction. There's no errors. It is the truth. Thank you for the truth. I praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I thank you for people who have not understood this, being able to grasp hold of this, especially some of these areas where there appears to be contradictions, but there aren't. Thank you for clarity, for everyone to understand this, and especially to realize that Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. He had to get that accomplished in order to get a new spirit for us. And also that it was the spiritual birth that occurred on the third day, and that he got his body on the first day of the week, as it declares in Mark 16, verse 9. Father, thank you for bringing clarity and revelation to all. We praise you for the truth, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.